All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this October Midday Science Cafe, Changing Climates and Changing Landscapes. What does this mean for the future? So thank you so much for being here. We have two amazing scientists, Dr. Carrie Johnson and Dr. Erica Sorilla Woodburn here to present for us. So if you are new to science um, at Cal and Berkeley Labs, Midday Science Cafe, welcome. If you are a return returning um, audience member and welcome to you as well. As normal, we are going to start with a land acknowledgement. We recognize that Berkeley sits on the Huchun territory, the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. Every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. By offering this land acknowledgement, the Berkeley community not only recognizes the history of the land on which we stand, but also recognizes that the Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. So thank you so much for allowing me to take the time um, I just wanted to remind you all that we have one more uh, Midday Science Cafe for this year, actually. Um, we'll take uh, December off for the holidays, but it's been such a fabulous year. I can't believe it. But the microbiome we will be presenting on November 18th at our regular time at 12 p.m. So we hope to see you there. Save the dates and you'll be getting invites very soon. Um, so my name is Dion Rossiter. I'm not sure if I said that yet, but I'm the executive director of Science at Cal. Science at Cal brings the wonders and excitement of UC Berkeley STEM research to the community. All of our events are free and open to the public and geared towards public audiences. Um, in 2001, Science at Cal was envisioned as a unifying effort to raise awareness and understanding and appreciation of the scientific research at UC Berkeley. And to realize this vision, we've engaged the vast Berkeley STEM communities, all of our researchers and scientists and engineers and mathematicians um, as science communicators. So presenting them to our community. We've had a ton of collaborators throughout this time. So here's a list of, of some of our different programs and some of our different collaborators. Um, we, we collaborate with consulates and libraries and we do, we go to first Friday events and farmer's market and community events. And of course, one of our favorite partners is the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Before I introduce Jen Tang to talk about Berkeley Lab and this partnership, I do want to remind you, one, that this uh, uh, webinar, this presentations and these lectures and this Q&A, all of this together will be recorded and we will send these out to all of you who are um, who are joining us today and anyone really in our community. They'll get notice of this um, when this is posted on our YouTube channels. The other thing I wanted to mention is that there is a live transcript and closed captioning. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see three dots typically. It may say closed captioning. It may say live transcripts. Um, as you click, maybe it says more. There's lots of different ways that you can see, you can find <laughs> the transcript and live uh, captioning uh, buttons for this. So I hope that you can find those. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say actually is that we will be allowing for Q&A throughout the presentation. So please ask your questions either in that Q&A box you see the button for or in the chat box. Either way is fine by us. We'll make sure to get all of your questions answered by both or either of our speakers. So now is my time to hand things over to Jen Tang from Berkeley Lab. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Dee. Uh, as she mentioned, I am Jen Tang and I'm the Director of Community Relations at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, and for those who aren't aware, Berkeley Lab is one of 17 US Department of Energy national laboratories across the country. And we are supported by the Department of Energy's Office of Science and managed by the University of California. All of the research we conduct is unclassified. And since our founding in 1931 by a physics professor at UC Berkeley named Ernest Orlando Lawrence, we've been dedicated to advancing the scope of human knowledge and seeking answers to some of the most tractable problems facing humankind. 
Yet today, Berkeley Lab employees are dedicated to developing meaningful scientific solutions to some of the world's most challenging energy issues. We're also helping train the next generation of scientists and engineers and ensuring that these things happen in a manner that benefits everyone. Our main campus is located in the Berkeley Hills and our close ties to the UC system really create a unique environment for scientific discovery. A number of the lab's uh, researchers uh, are affiliated with one of the UC campuses, you know, either as students, as postdocs, uh, or professors that have joint appointments at the lab. And we're especially fortunate to have a close relationship with UC Berkeley uh, and our institutions have joined forces to advance science across a number of frontiers. Now, one of the main motivations for creating our Midday Science Cafe series is to share with you examples of that research that is coming out of our institutions. And so we hope you enjoy today's presentation on the impacts of a changing climate uh, on the ecosystems around us. And uh, with that, it is actually my pleasure to introduce our first speaker to the screen, Erica Cirilla Woodburn. Erica is a research scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory with a focus on computational hydrology. And she and her group study the movement and partitioning of water, both in natural and managed environments, ranging from hill slopes to watershed scales, uh, with recent topics including climate change and extremes, groundwater storage dynamics, and quantitative risk assessment. She received her PhD in hydrology from the Colorado School of Mines in 2013 and was a postdoc at the Polytechnic University of Barcelona before she came to the lab in 2015. In her spare time, Erica likes to explore the outdoors with her two young sons. Erica, over to you. Okay, let's see if I can do this correctly. Thank you so much, Jen, for the introduction and uh, to Dee and Jen both for the for the invitation to be here today. Um, all right, so um, yeah, as said earlier today, I think we're going to be talking mostly about this topic of changing climates and changing landscapes. What does that mean for the future? Uh, I'll specifically focus on mountains and, and snowpack, um, and then we'll hear a bit more about some other impacts of climate change on, on the landscape. Um, later in, in the discussion. And so before I, I talk, I begin my talk here, I wanna acknowledge a, a long list of co-authors who really made significant contributions to this work. Okay, so to start, I wanna talk about climate change, which is really the, the long-term shift in global and regional climate patterns. And today we know that human-induced climate changes impact um, a number of things, but specifically we think about warmer temperatures, rising sea levels, and shifts in extreme precipitation patterns, bringing about things like intense droughts and storms. So today I'll make the case that snow is really one of the best indicators of climate change, and I'll discuss why an emphasis on snowpack changes is really important to consider opposed to other factors impacted by climate change. And that's really because there's this great certainty we know in how snowpack will respond to warmer climates. And this makes a declining snowpack one of the most robust um, indicators of, of a changing climate. So while climate change is altering landscapes globally, we know particularly large changes can be seen in mountainous environments. And this has really potential catastrophic implications for water resource management and supply. And so while I'll focus today on the Western US, societies across the world who really uh, rely on, on snow as a source of fresh water um, are obviously gonna be impacted. So this is truly a global problem. So to start, we know that snowpack loss is already occurring uh, globally and in some places really at considerable rates. The USDA and other collaborators have monitored snow manually since as early as the 1900s. Um, and since the 1980s, more fre frequent data has been available via uh, snow telemetry, also known as SnowTel, uh, which is a network of gauges. Recent work has shown that, uh, that peak uh, snowpacks in, in the Western US, um, usually measured on April 1st of each year, have declined um, really significantly since the 1950s. And 
some statistics point to this, this decline in um, over 90% of stations with accompanying snow loss on the magnitude of 23%. So really to put that into perspective, a 23% decline in snow is roughly equivalent, equi equivalent to the largest surface water reservoir in the Western US, uh, Lake Mead. And so we're talking really about massive uh, amounts of snow loss and water loss. As another way to put the magnitude of snowpack loss into perspective, um, this graph here shows the amount of water stored in the Sierra Nevada snowpack as these white bars versus California reservoirs, which are shown in the two shades of blue. The y-axis is the uh, total amount of water storage in units of uh, millions of acre feet, which is simply a way to measure really large amounts of water. So one million acre feet is equal to one acre of land covered in one foot of water. So annually spring snow melt nearly doubles surface water storage reservoir, uh, surface water storage in California. And so by sheer volume without snowpack, the water system could really ultimately fail. And that failure is really because water is managed and the sort of infrastructure that was built around how we manage water was really uh, put into place with this assumption of a reliable snowpack. So to demonstrate that, this figure shows that, that there's these large scale connections of water in the Western US. On the left, you can see uh, historical median snowpack conditions in this blue shading and major river networks also in, in this color blue. And the size of those lines of the rivers is, is scaled by the thickness. You can also see connections to reservoirs as um, these blue circles, which are also scaled in magnitude. And then the connection of, of this natural system with, um, with man-made water conveyance and infrastructure. So things like aqueducts or pipelines, and those are shown as some of these, these red lines. The figure on the right shows the connection of this hybrid human natural system uh, with, with many different uh, water sectors that rely on the movement of water from mountains to end users. And this includes hydropower, hydropower agriculture, and of course, of course, supply to metropolitan areas. So considerations also need to be made given that lower snowpacks will also um, result in really earlier snow melt timing. And so a 2012 study showed that peak snow melt is actually occurring two days earlier per decade in most locations across the Western US, or said another way, up to eight days earlier per degree Celsius of warming. So this simple schematic shows how um, historically many winter wet, summer dry regions that use uh, winter snowpack and, and associated melt to really bridge the gap between when water is supplied and, and when water demands are at its highest. And you can see here that concerningly as snow melt becomes earlier in the year, there's this further disconnect between water supply timing and water demand timing. And so what this can really mean in terms of, um, of water shortages is that they can be more significant and they can again occur earlier in the year. So when can we really expect this transition to occur? And when should we really as a society prepare for a water failure? To answer the question of when, a group of my colleagues at Berkeley Lab and other universities and a few water agency, agencies came together this last year to piece together what it would mean to have a low to no snow future and really to determine um, from the literature the time of that transition. So we synthesized over 300 peer reviewed journal articles and performed an analysis on the, some of the studies which detail the timing of snowpack disappearance. And the results are shown here as this little movie is animating through different regions in the, in the Western US uh, to show sort of the magnitude of snow loss over some um, key periods of time before um, 2100. And in general, you can see that there's some sort of spatial differences depending on which 
uh, mountain range is, is considered. But in general, you can see by, um, by mid-century on the order of a 25% loss in snow and by end of century up to 50% loss. Um, so pretty considerable. So that's great, but unfortunately, it's not really as simple as just understanding when snow disappears. Although, as I just showed, it's not really a trivial pursuit in itself. <laughs> um, so changes in snowpack uh, are going to pose a series of cascading impacts on the landscape. And, and this schematic sort of um, illustrates some of those, those expected changes. On the right, you can see in a, in a low to no snow future, you can have things like changes in your stream flow patterns, in your groundwater recharge, recharge patterns. You might have things like um, a shift in species or higher occurrence of wildfires. And then you're also gonna have uh, changes in how much water goes back to the atmosphere given you have warmer conditions. So these interactions are all simultaneous and that makes it really difficult to disentangle um, really what it would mean for water resources. So furthermore, this is actually a, a really complicated problem because it's multidisciplinary and it's also multi-scale. So most of the snow projections I just showed um, really consider some of those physical processes at some of these larger scales. But the implications of those changes on the hydrology really occur at a much smaller scale at the watershed scale or subwatershed scale. So this leads to a whole slew of physical mechanisms that I don't really have time to discuss today, but that need to be considered in terms of uh, what kind of processes are gonna be impacted in, in a future with less snow. And at the same time, considerations also need to be made in terms of water management sectors and how they um, think about these, these physical changes in sort of their operations. And that of course spans a continuum of scales as well. So snowpack loss therefore points to this need of researchers and stakeholders who come from, you know, traditionally really isolated disciplines and sectors to come together to tackle this problem. In recent years, my colleagues and I at Berkeley Lab have been working towards a modeling framework which can allow us to uh, make simulations that span from the atmosphere through the bedrock and from global to local scales. And so we really think about tracking uh, the full life cycle of water through these coupled models. And so they're, they're computationally expensive. We, we have to rely on supercomputers, um, but that allows us to use some cutting edge abilities to bridge disciplines and scales. For example, we're able to, to zoom in to a specific region of a model um, and to, to be able to study that in more detail. For example, we're doing some work which allows us to track the full life cycle of water. Um, and so for the Western US, we think about specific types of storms like atmospheric rivers, which are really responsible for much of the Western coast water supply. And with these coupled techniques, we can track water from, from again, atmosphere through bedrock um, and understand where that, where that water will ultimately end up. Another uh, project I'm, I'm deeply involved in uses data from one of the most highly instrumented watersheds in the world. This is the Watershed Function Scientific Focus Area, or SFA, that is located in the East River of, of the Colorado, Upper Colorado River Basin. <laughs> and the Upper Colorado is really the water tower of the West. It supplies, um, as we say here, up to, or it does supply one in 10 Americans um, water. It has huge um, supplies for irrigation, hydroelectric, and, it, and the East River, um, as, the, as shown in some of these photos here, is really representative of many headwaters of, of, the, of, of the upper Colorado. Um, and it's, it's uh, unique in that um, we have multiple data layers multiple numerical techniques that are being developed here through um, a, this DOE supported project, which allows us to test different hypotheses and to better understand how mountains function in the face of climate change. So it's really regarded as one of the, uh, this rare community test bed where more and more partners from different federal, federal agencies are coming together to tackle this problem. 
In the East River, my group is developing hydrologic models um, that really try to understand when and where mover water is moving. So the figure on the left is some work from a postdoc who's working with me, James Dennity Frank, and his work is looking at um, trying to understand over a, a single water year how, um, how water is uh, partitioning from uh, stream flow, which is kind of these, this blue color here, versus moving back to the atmosphere, uh, atmosphere via evapotranspiration. And that's some of these red colors here. So we're, again, we're able to do this in space and time. And then what's, I think, really exciting is that we're able to compare how the model behaves to um, observations. So we're using things like stable isotopes, which act as a way to sort of fingerprint the, the water, where it's come from. And this allows us to better constrain our conceptual models of, of that water partitioning. And so if our predictions of the model were perfect with observations, we would have all these points plotted along this, this line here. Um, and so learning from differences really allows us to understand um, what we're getting right, what we're getting wrong in order to pre prepare for the future. And then I think this will be my last slide. Um, and I, I just wanna point to the future and ways to proactively think about preparing for snow related water failures. And so there's you know, a, a number of different approaches that could be used to think about building resilience into current practices. Um, some of them are detailed here, I won't go through it all, but you could think about adaptation of existing hard um, infrastructure, building new infrastructure, um, adapting some of that infrastructure for, for kind of these more exciting uh, ways to, to use existing um, things in place like forecast informed uh, reservoir operations to sort of um, get the water that we have now to, to sort of last longer within a given year. You could think about new water. So this would things like um, desalination or cloud seeding or really changing the amount of water demands that we have. Uh, so uh, more efficient agriculture practices, more efficient water appliances in the home or changing um, you know, the market and pricing. So it's, it's more than likely that there's no sort of silver bullet to build resilience against snowpack loss and that an adoption of multiple of these strategies will really be needed to curb the effects of a low to no snow future. But I think it takes discussions such as these here today, which I'm really excited about, <laughs> and education outreach, you know, changes in policy, prior, prioritization um, to really um, prepare for this future with less snow. So I think I'm over my time, but thank you. And I look forward to the conversation. Fantastic. Thanks, Erica, so much for your presentation. Um, so we've got a couple questions for you uh, before we hand it over to our next speaker. And the first is, you know, we've seen a significant increase in wildfires in the Western U.S. over the last several years. You know, you mentioned that in your in your presentation. Can you talk about how they impact water availability, especially in mountainous ecosystems? Yeah, this is a another topic near and dear to my heart. Um, we're actually studying a wildfire pretty actively, the Caldor fire. In, in Northern California right now. Um, there's, there's a lot to be done in this space. I think, um, you know, in addition to the sort of immediate devastation from the wildfires, there's this other piece that's like, what happens after the wildfire comes through um, in terms of water supply? So there's problems thinking about um, large scale erosion, sediment fluxes into, into the rivers, um, large scale debris flows are really big concern that happens um, for example, Montecito that made the news nationwide. Um, but then there's also things that I think are less talked about like water quality and, um, and disruptions to ecosystems and uh, forest regeneration. So um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard one. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and then another question for you. You talked a lot about using models. How trustworthy are models in predicting future water scenarios? Um, and I'm, I'm also curious, how important are supercomputers like the one at Berkeley Lab in running those models? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, of course, a continuum of models that I think can be used for projections or understanding behavior. So in, in our group, we're really 
um, on one end of that spectrum where we where we really um, want to trust the system, trust the model's use of um, an equation of this sort of underlying physics of the of the system to be able to think about, you know, as I said, some of these sort of um, often convoluting, convoluted, uh, simultaneous react, you know, things going on at once. You kind of just trust the model's ability to um, to simulate the, those physics. Um, and you know, it's mod hydrologic models have come a long way. It was only a few decades ago that that groundwater and surface water, for example, were treated so totally separately. And we know that that's not real. So I think, you know, it's continually evolving and um, the, the, the more physics we can put into the, into the model in theory, um, the better. And so that becomes really computationally expensive. So you asked, I think about the, the supercomputing aspect. And with that, we can, we can really come down in scale, both in time and in space to resolve things, features of the landscape, or incorporate, you know, more um, complex physics into the into our, our set of equations that would otherwise not be feasible if we're just, you know, running our models on our laptops. So that's also a huge advancement as well. Fantastic. Thanks, Erica, for those answers. And I see we're getting some questions for you, which we'll save for the Q&A at the end. Uh, for now, let me turn it over to Dee, who is going to introduce our next speaker. Yes, thank you, Jen. And thank you again, Erica, that was wonderful. Um, I have the privilege and pleasure to announce our next speaker, Carrie Washington. And we went to grad school together, everyone. So she's very, um, I've known her for a while. She's special to me. So I'm so excited to have one of my very own colleagues join us. Carrie holds a PhD in geology with a specialization in geomorph geomorphology from the University of California, Santa Cruz. In her postdoctoral work from UC Berkeley, she has been working with the UC Natural Reserve System and the Moore Foundation funded California Heartbeat Initiative Freshwater. Her work is focused on understanding the mechanism, mechanisms by which landscape systems respond to climate and land use changes in hopes of helping improve land management in the face of changing climate. She is interested in the interactions between bedrock weathering, soil, plants, hill slope water storage, and runoff genera generation and river processes. Her love of gardening actually helped her notice that the plants were controlling all of the processes she was trying to study from a geologic perspective. Her love of sailing and the California Channel Islands accidentally led her to the perfect place to study her fascination with landscape resilience and to disturbance and gully erosion. So we will learn all about this now. It is my pleasure to hand things over to Carrie Johnson. Thanks, Dee, um, and thank you, Jen, for the invitation to join you all today and talk about how erosion and climate relate. Um, this project, as Dee said, is part of the California Heartbeat Initiative, which was funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation across the UC Reserve System. Um, first off, I wanted to find gully for you. Um, gully erosion is a process where stream channels rapidly extend upslope, slicing through what were previously soil-covered hill slopes. Um, these gashes on the landscape efficiently drain water out of any remaining hill slope soil. And like we saw with Erica's talk, loss of water storage in this reservoir means the storm water arrives downstream all at once causing floods and also means that water can't be stored for later in the season when plants growing on these hill slopes really need it most. Um, Goalies are a common problem up and down California and beyond and are often seen following disturbance, such as changes in land management or fire. In addition to the loss of this precious resource, soil erosion also can release large amounts of stored carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, and that's eroded soil also becomes a pollutant when it washes downstream, clogging fish habitat in streams and smothering near coastal habitat with mud like we see in this picture here. Um, so I have put together a very high-tech physical model for you today. 
Um, in this model, you can see that the tilted cookie sheet represents the bedrock landscape and the sponge represents the soil on top. In soil covered landscapes, when it rains, the soil acts as a reservoir absorb, absorbing and holding water. And you can see that eventually the soil reservoir gets full and water starts leaving the landscape through the stream network. Um, these streams continue to flow long after the storms are over. And this is a landscape that has a lot of good habitat in that um, moist soil and um, perennial streams. When soil is eroded off the landscape, water runs really quickly and isn't easily stored on that landscape. So you can see that these streams have much higher flows during that storm and quickly go dry between storms. Um, you can imagine that landscapes like this are hard to live on. Uh, plants don't have the water um, they need to hold them over between storms and across droughts. It's also hard to live in streams like this. So the place on the landscape where stream channels end and hill slopes begin moves around as a result of a tug of war between different processes. The white crosses on this picture are where streams likely used to end on the landscape before this disturbance, um, in this case grazing, happened. Um, so, and these black crosses are where the stream network is today. Um, yeah, so the processes that create and smooth and stabilize soils are uh, what I'll call today team hill slope soil. And these are often controlled by plants. Drought, fire, and overgrazing reduce the ability of plants to hold hill slope soils in place and hurt team hill slope soil. Processes of stream channel erosion and expansion are dominated by the influence of water flowing across hill slopes during storms. You can imagine a pile of sand, and if one of those grocery store misters sprayed the sand continuously, not much erosion would happen. But if the sand pile were sprayed with a garden hose, even just for a moment, a lot of that sand might be washed away. Oops. More intense, um, yeah, more intense. Storms uh, do more erosion, even if they don't come very often. And in addition, you may have seen gullies where roads bring storm flows to one specific spot. And this is another way we can concentrate flow, strengthening team channel erosion for that part of the whole state. So climate models are predicting conditions which will influence both of these teams and which will likely exacerbate gully erosion. This plot shows model predictions for the frequency of extreme dry seasons. As we move along this brown line, you can see um, that this, start, this frequency of extreme dry seasons starts to go up and by 2075, it reaches up to 200% more frequent than historically. Um, so these models are run to predict conditions in the past, and then they are compared with weather in the past to check that they work well. And that le lends a lot of credibility to these future predictions and um, what they mean for goalie networks. As we're seeing with recent droughts, uh, droughts cause stress to vegetation, and this will reduce the power of team hillslope soil to hold hill slopes in its place. This plot shows the model predictions for changes in the frequency of extreme wet seasons. So we see that these are also increasing by almost 200% by 2075. Um, this is not more water on the landscape, but water lumped into bigger storms and wetter years. So this is another uh, concentration of flow and this will help team channel erosion and pull the balance of this tug of war more towards gully erosion. In weak bedrock, like the mudstones and shales that are so common across California, gullies don't just erode through soil, but they can erode deep into the bedrock. Landscapes with these weak bedrocks look really different in different climates, which gets us thinking, how does climate affect landscape shape and function? 
In wetter climates like those in Northern California, vegetation holds soil in place. And if erosion happens, vegetation can get reestablished quickly and stabilize that bare soil before things get out of hand. Uh, team soil has a huge advantage in these wetter climates and these landscapes are quite resilient to disturbance. In contrast, in the desert, landscapes built on these same types of rock are made up of smaller channels all the way up to the ridge tops. So team channel erosion has already won completely. Uh, these are fully channelized bedrock landscapes, which are called bedrock badlands. And they probably get this name because plants have a really hard time living and growing in places that shed water so efficiently and don't hold water in hillslope soils. Um, most of California's iconic soil covered rolling hills sit on the stable side of this threshold between these two types of landscapes. Um, but with this climate model predicting change, we'd expect that some of those landscapes with soil covered hill slopes today will be quite vulnerable to catastrophic landscape change if not managed carefully in the future. I really wanted to understand the threshold between these two types of landscapes. And so I went looking for a site where these two teams were really closely matched in this tug of war. Um, my search led me to Santa Cruz Island off the coast of Southern California. Uh, the island was covered in soil before about 150 years of overgrazing put a lot of stress on the island's vegetation and began a period of really intense erosion. In parts of the island with the same weak bedrock that I have been talking about in the last slide, Gullies started marching up into the landscape and flushing hillslope soils out to sea. This is a telltale first step in this collapse towards a bedrock badland. But across the site, gully progression was really different on different hillslopes with different local climates, and um, we'll call these microclimates. The large area with uniform bedrock and uniform land management gives it, makes it the perfect natural experiment to explore the influence of climate on goalie erosion and landscape resilience um, to soil disturbance. Oh, I was gonna show you a picture of the pretty sheep. <laughs> so let's take a look at these grazing induced erosion features on Santa Cruz Island. In the lower right hand corner, there's some people um, for scale. Before sheep, this was all soil covered hill slope. You can see green patches of that old hill slope. Be, um, and between them, you can see tan patches of, of the gully channels that now dissect it. These gullies, some of which are 30 meters deep, really efficiently drain water that would otherwise have been stored in the landscape and used by plants year round. After 40 years of sh sheep being, after 40 years of having the sheep removed, um, these gullies are still really actively eroding, sending mud out to sea during storms. So in those places, team soil erosion or channel erosion is still winning. But now at the end of this video, we're moving into a slightly different microclimate and you can see the difference here in the 40 years since sheep have been gone from the landscape, um, vegetation is starting to re-stabilize these gully features and um, team hill slope soil is getting the upper hand. Oops. So we measured these differences in gully encroachment into hill slopes. Um, I've mapped the gullies in red here. And we've looked at 48 hill slopes of the same size. Um, those are these blue units. Um, now all these blue hill slopes used to be fully covered in soil without any stream channels. And so we've picked these carefully to make sure that they're all, um, the only difference between them is the local climate, such as the orientation of the hill slope to sun and fog. Um, and I've calculated a whole suite of climate influencing conditions for each of these little unit hill slopes that used to be just soil covered and now have different extents of gully incision into them. And I wanted to compare um, all these local climate conditions to, to see what specific conditions made hill slopes more resilient to disturbance. So we know that water stress changes how plants reflect light. Um, we see this with our eyes when a plant turns from green to yellow to brown. 
Um, so we've used drones with cameras on them that can detect similar but much more subtle changes in plant water status. Uh, if we zoom into the same ridge, we can see darker greens representing healthier vegetation and yellows showing water stressed vegetation. Um, orange here is bare ground. And so a lot of the gullies are colored orange. We see darker greens on the wetter north facing, fog facing hill slopes where gullies were smaller and more likely to be stabilized by plants. Um, behind the drone here, you can see one of our weather stations where we are collecting um, differences in hills, like local hill slope climate or weather data. And we're finding that in these more resilient hill slopes, shallow soil moisture, humidity, and temperature are the variables that best predict, predict plant health. Um, and we're finding in general that north facing and fog facing are hill slopes that are oriented to catch incoming fog off the ocean, generally have less gully erosion and healthier plants. We've collected on the ground plant community data and then also the weather data from these hill slopes. And these data are helping us disentangle the influence of things like fog from um, soil, uh, sun radiation and soil moisture and plant type. And we're finding that in drier years, fog water seems to be the main difference. And this water seems to come at just the driest time of year and helps hold these plants over. So when we put team hillslope soil up against team channel erosion in a landscape evolution model, we can replicate easily the, um, the soil covered landscapes of Northern California and the badland landscapes of California's deserts. When we re reduce the strength of vegetation um, enough in a formerly soil covered landscape, we find that the first step on the way to badlands is this encroachment of gullies into the hillslopes. If we put this erosion in context, um, it helps us think about what's left to erode on the landscape or where this landscape's headed. In places with similar bedrock to the rock um, of this area of Santa Cruz Island, badlands have only about a fifth of the height of the soil covered hill slopes. Um, so if we take a transect across our study site and plot it here with elevation on the y-axis, and distance along that hill slope transect on the Y. That's this um, pink color. We can see, and then plot on top of that the the theoretical landscape height from our models, which is this blue color. We can see that there's a lot of landscape that has yet to be eroded, even though we see this first wave of gullies. There's a lot more erosion that needs to happen before this landscape. Uh, settles down and becomes stable. So that's a lot of mud that's yet to wash downstream and out to sea and a lot of carbon that is yet to be released to the atmosphere and also a lot of plant habitat that could be lost. But our natural experiment shows us that not all parts of this landscape are headed in this direction. In slightly wetter microclimates, we found that soils are resilient and that these gullies that scar the landscape are probably just relics of an old and less sustainable land management practice that are being stabilized now by new vegetation. In slightly drier places, we found that temporary disturbance was just enough to push the landscape over the edge towards these bad land um, systems. Some of those places could really use our help to restabilize them. And with this framework, we can focus our efforts where restoration work is most likely to be successful and needed. So with climate showing more extreme droughts and storms, we expect the same sort of calf, um, the same sort of change in resilience or um, how fragile these landscapes are. And we expect this to, to move across um, our state and some of California's iconic golden rolling hills that were once quite resilient to erosion may become more fragile, or actually I should say, will likely become more fragile and will need more care and sustainable land use planning. So we hope this framework helps focus these efforts. And thank you so much for listening. And I look forward to our discussion.
Thank you so much, Carrie. That was wonderful. So we have a few questions. Um, the first question is, do you have photos of the Santa Cruz Island before the sheep? There are not photos because the sheep were introduced um, in the early 1800s. There, mm -hmm. and there are some historic photos, but not something like an air photo. Like we'd really like to be able to show this precisely. There are, however, some really beautiful maps that were drawn by the Coast Survey, um, which was a team of people using telemetry, um, like triangulation to map this landscape. And whenever I look at these maps, I'm just in awe of the job that they did. It's a skill that I learned in undergrad that doesn't get used very much anymore. And um, they're just so incredible, but they're hand-drawn maps and they, so you, it takes a little bit of interpretation and they do draw hill slopes without gullies on them. Um, you have to wonder, did they just forget to add the gullies or not? Um, but those maps really convinced me that that point in time was the first initiation. They were um, drawn a little bit after the beginning of ranching. Mm -hmm. And um, they do have very specific um, places on the landscape drawn where they have deep channels and then that transitions into shallow streams. And so that shows me that these are things we call head cuts, but places where these, the wave of these deep and sized channels are just getting started to move into the landscape. So because they clearly show these places lower in the landscape, we can make the interpretation that higher in the landscape, the soil was still intact. Very cool. I'd love to see those maps. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> next time you can add with this. I have beautiful. them lower in this deck if you want to see later. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Time. Maybe we'll have time to see some of those. Um, that'd okay. be awesome. Maybe. Yeah. Um, maybe cue that up when we get everyone, um, when, um, you know, maybe Erica, when Erica is asking, answering a question, but, um, sort of, you know, somebody asked a question and I think you got to this at the very end about sort of these mitigation solutions, you know, for coastal erosion, we're thinking about seawalls and break walls and these sorts of things. And it sounds like really restoration is that beginning of, um, sort of how we mitigate some of these effects, um, of the gully erosion. Anything else you want to add to that? I know that came before you started talking about restoration, but anything you want to add to that? So I think that with any landscape adaptation to climate change, you have to think about living with the new conditions of your climate. Um, mm -hmm. I think what this project has really given me in terms of excitement and hope around um, better land stewardship is this idea that there are parts of the landscape where climate change is going to make them into a desert and we can't support uh, soil mantled rolling hills mm -hmm. somewhere like the Anza Borrego Badlands. Um, but there's other parts of the landscape where our our land management is the thing that pushed the system over into that state. And in those places, we have a much higher uh, chance of pushing the system back and keeping it back. Um, essentially, mitigating our own disturbance. Um, right. And, and, and I think working together with botanists and geologists, geomorphologists, to look at these systems from a much broader um, and more interdisciplinary lens is really exciting in that it helps us um, pinpoint these places where our restoration efforts can be extremely successful and where we can get the most reward for the energy we have because we don't have infinite resources. Um, and we'd like to be able to use them in ways that can have a long lasting effect. So yes, restoration, soil, erosion mitigation measures. These are all things that we use after wildfires. They're things that we use in the bottoms of gullies when, um, you know, a rancher is frustrated that this gully keeps cutting up into their land. Right. Um, but people have been doing this for a really long time. A lot of times you'll see people have um, parked really old cars down there back in the 1800s trying to stop these gullies from chopping up. But um, 
But I think this type of interdisciplinary lens allows us to be really focused in these efforts and, and put them in places where that make a big difference. Yeah. Well, I have a follow-up question to that, but I'll, I'll ask Jen and Erica to, to join us and you can go ahead and stop sharing your screen um, as we sort of transition into this uh, Q&A where we bring everyone together. And we have lots of questions coming in in the chat. Um, so I'll hand things over to you, Jen, before I, I follow up with some more questions with Gary. Sure, thanks, Dee. Uh, so Erica, going back to your presentation, we got a couple questions that I wanted to make sure we asked you. Um, you know, the first is in your presentation, you mentioned that there may be this sort of looming low or even no snow future. So are there any actions that can be taken right now to slow down the speed with which that scenario might be might be in our near future? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think I was just thinking about that, actually, <laughs> um, in terms of what we as individuals can do. I think there's a lot of, you know, like societal changes that um, we as individuals contribute to. Um, but I think it's all about our carbon footprint really um, and our water footprint and thinking about um, the decisions we make, even small decisions in our diet or our travel or what kind of, you know, things we purchase or kind of car you drive um, that lead to um, emissions. And so m many of those projections that I show today are based on sort of a business as usual, sort of the, the colloquial way to talk about some of these different projections um, of, of climate warming. And so that's sort of, you know, in some ways, the worst case scenario, although you could sort of imagine things getting worse as well, but it's sort of the end member of, of, of what's typically thought of as kind of a, a worst case scenario. But there's, of course, you know, um, all these different things that we as people and uh, we can we can voice our opinions and we can also um, um, think think broader about how um, a society we we are we're thinking about the future and and thinking the past not just um, our generations but the generations of of our kids or grandkids too. So certainly there's there's a lot of um, potential to abate climate change. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Erica. Uh, so this question, I think maybe could be for both of you, and I'm not sure that you guys have the expertise, but we got this question, so we'll toss it out there, uh, especially since, Erica, you mentioned individual actions that we can take. Um, somebody asked, at a practical level, um, how should, you know, for example, landscape professionals or maybe even homeowners be adjusting to changes in water availability? What do you think, Carrie? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I saw a street the other day where every single lawn was brown and it looked, it was so heartwarming to see the solidarity of the whole group of neighbors taking that step together. Um, so I think definitely in choices around how you landscape your yard, how you wash your dishes, um, how you take baths and, <laughs> I think of this with my daughter, um, trying to think about, uh, maybe we shouldn't fill the bathtub, maybe we should have a little bucket, this kind of stuff. Um, I don't know. I think a lot of it is also political in terms of how we vote, because that affects the bigger, bigger, we can have a broader reach when we work together. Yeah, I think I'll just chime in and say, I think it's also a mindset, right? Um, I think, you know, we know that some, for example, for water demands, a big fraction of our water comes from, our water use as people comes from agriculture. And so I think when people hear that, they think, well, if I leave the water on while I'm brushing my teeth, you know, it has just a very negligible impact on things. What does it matter? But I think if we're constantly having that mindset, then um, that sort of transfers into how we think about, you know, living together <laughs> and again about the future generation. So um, changes our thinking when we're standing in the grocery store, making decisions. Excellent. Well, I think that, that was a great, a great response actually. So I'm glad you guys both had a chance to chime in. Thank you. And thank you for the person who asked that question. 
Um, so Carrie, it was helpful for you, this person says that, um, to point out how gullies can actually release carbon. I'm a, this person says, I'm aware that rapid erosion can also sequester carbon through mineralization. Um, I don't know if you wanna talk about that at all, um, but their specific question is, is there any work on the relative balance between these two effects, between sequestering carbon and also um, how you point out releasing carbon through the erosion process? Yes, so there is a lot of work on this topic and it depends on what you're eroding. Um, in the case of soil erosion, soil is a great reservoir for sequestering carbon. Um, so organic matter gets converted into really stable forms of carbon that um, you basically build up this layer of soil and you're storing more and more carbon. The more water percolates through that soil, the more carbon is brought into the soil. And so when you erode that soil, you remobilize all that stored carbon that form like was stored over the time scale of that soil formation. Um, so soil erosion is an easy way to put all that carbon back into the atmosphere or back into the environment um, where it can be degraded and put into the atmosphere. Um, the idea of erosion sequestering carbon is a totally different, this is bedrock erosion and it's erosion of carbonate materials and that's a chemical reaction of those rocks interacting with the water as they flow and creating new minerals. Um, so I guess when we think about human timescales and the rapid pace of erosion um, that we see with human activity, it's a very different time scale than the types of feedbacks between erosion and climate that we've seen in glacial interglacial cycles. Um, when you think about a whole landscape that's undergoing an erosional change, um, you have to think about the fast erosion, which is eroding that soil off the top of the landscape. That's a lot faster than getting into like deep bedrock erosion where canyons are slicing down through hard rock. Um, and so I guess I'm, I'm hesitating because as I say this, I suspect in glacial and glacial cycles, you probably did have that faster first wave of, of erosion and then you get down into this deeper um, bedrock erosion. But essentially that feedback between the two, we're seeing a lot more of that superficial erosion from soil loss right now than we are like deepening of of canyons. With these projections of more intense storms, we would expect to see more bedrock erosion because you do have these bigger storms moving through those deep bedrock canyons, but um, the rate at which that erosion happens uh, is a much longer time scale. You could probably build another one of those analogies with the ropes, huh? Yeah. <laughs> there. <laughs> the second one. Yeah. All right, we're gonna hand things back over to Jen. Thanks both. Um, so Erica, going back to the intersection of wildfires and, and water, can you talk about whether the particulate matter from wildfires has any long-term impact on precipitation? Particulate matter has an impact on precipitation? Yeah. Um, not sure if I understand. So you're saying, could you say a little bit more? Oh, oh, yeah. oh, sorry, Kurt? Are you talking about like cloud seeding before the Olympics and stuff like that? Uh, no, I think this is more about, um, you know, the, the, the ash coming from wildfires. So I think that's what they mean by particulate matter. Ah. So does, does like the ash falling from the sky or other, you know, particulate matter that's generated by wildfires have, have an impact long-term on, on water and precipitation? Does that gotcha. make sense? Yeah, it's a little outside of my kind of expertise, which is probably why I didn't understand it at first. <laughs> um, you know, I think I think there's uh, un undoubtedly, um, I would assume. I, yeah, like I said, it's not sort of what the the type of things that I've been studying, but um, it's in the news lately with the sort of fire generated cumulus clouds, and mm -hmm. I think they said that that you know, the fine particulates do condense more moisture to them, but the, that water isn't necessarily falling out of those clouds. It's just, it's sort of yeah. 
Yeah, it, I guess you're like you're saying it's there's some analogies to cloud seeding, which is basically you um, it was just you know done in part in, in places in the West where you're basically putting um, artificial particulates in the atmosphere to to try to generate precipitation. Um, and I guess um, there are sub there are some serious um, implications for ash. For example, I know about like uh, changes in albedo to to existing snowpacks and how that has sort of um, a, a mechanism to change the energy balance of the snow so that it melts more rapidly. And so then you get more melts and you get it earlier. And so then that changes your water cycle in another way, right? So you get your, um, you're getting more water leaving the system earlier. And that of course can feed back to your, you know, overall water cycle. So yeah, I could look into that more for you, but <laughs> it's an interesting topic. I'll the thing just I keep going back to is that systems are all connected, right? Yeah. I will just say this is actually my area of expertise. Okay. Um, and oh, excellent. <laughs> we'll have you jump in. <laughs> and I will just say, I know I'm not presenting here, but it's like, oh, I can talk about this. The um, climate the, scientist. Yeah. The largest source of uncertainty in all of climate change, if we're thinking about all of these different sources, is actually clouds. And so how we're feeding the clouds with particulate matter, ash, how those clouds are changing their reflectivity, how those clouds are carrying water, how those clouds are raining when, where, all of that is the largest source of uncertainty. It's very actually hard to pinpoint how those changes, sort of like how both Carrie and Eric are saying, there's so many different things that are happening all at once. How really that's going to influence uh, our climate is, is actually really hard to study. So if we have any young scientists um, out there, this is one of those spaces where there's gonna be a lot more research and thinking about how all of these factor into climate models um, and uh, this is another space where you can use satellite imagery to try to understand what's happening. Um, but yeah, there is a, this is exactly analogous to the uh, cloud seeding um, scenario um, that Carrie asked about. And um, yeah, so I, I'll just say that it's difficult to say. Um, we'll leave it at that. But there's a lot of research going on in this area. Um, but the clouds do affect, uh, sorry, the ash and the soot does affect the lifetime and the reflectivity of the clouds. Um, and what that means for climate and how water is distributed is to be de determined, which is why it makes it so scary because they're actually very sensitive systems. They're not only sensitive to particulates, but they're also sensitive, very sensitive to temperature. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. But may maybe I'll take it, ask Carrie um, our next question. Um, so let me go to, um, Actually, this has this has to do with sort of how fog you a lot of these systems, at least the systems that you're describing here, sort of hinder on this fog. Are you guys uh, thinking about how fog is changing and and adding that to sort of your simulations for how because it does seem to be um, right that that the one factor that does determine whether or not this regrowth happens or not in this particular area on the Santa Cruz Islands is the fog. So are you thinking about how that fog's changing? Yes, and this is, um, I, I was thinking about this when you were talking, this is one of those big uncertainties. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, our fellow grad student, Travis O'Brien, I was always asking him like, tell me how the fog works. and. Well, it could go this way, it could go this way. And there's so much really interesting work that's being done on this, but um, it is a big unknown. And it is something that the more I look into, the more I realize the far reaching effects of, I thought it was just this coastal phenomenon, but we have sites for the California Heartbeat Initiative Project all across California. And so many of them are influenced by fog. It's this source of water that comes right at the dry part of the year and, um, and it brings in water when these plants need it the most. And even if that water, there's so many different ways to deliver that fog to the landscape. Um, if the fog is high above the landscape, it's providing shade, which helps um, reduce water stress on the plants in some ways, but that's not actually putting water into the, it's not, that, that water is not available to those plants directly. Um, but if that fog comes in a little bit lower and intersects the, the hill slope um, topography, 
then that water can start being um, collected by trees. There's a lot of trees that have leaves adapted to be able to really grab that water efficiently, like redwood needles. And on the islands, the invasive fennel plants are really good at, they have these long um, leaves that are really good at pulling that water out of the, the fog cloud and dripping it down into its roots and also absorbing that water through through the leaves. Um, and so there's a lot of variables, even when a model predicts fog, it's mm -hmm. hard to tell whether or not that is going to be fog, uh, water delivery to the landscape or just shade from that fog. Um, we have a, a collaborator who is putting some fog harps out at our weather stations and he's a modeler. So I'm really excited to see what, where he goes with that because he's trying to ask these big questions about how do, fog, how do climate models predict fog and can we link that to actual data on the ground? So hopefully, hopefully uh, he'll have some good stories soon. Excellent. And this, that's a great, a great response because that, that goes, that kind of traveled right into that question about the fog. So the next question had to do with the, you had showed a picture of the reduction, or excuse me, a graph of the reduction in dry season um, very early on in your presentation. And at some point um, at the end of that graph, um, it says, what's the explanation for the reduction in dry season? So actually you were showing that there was an increase in dry season, right? And at the end of the plot, there was a reduction. Do you have any insights into why there was a reduction in dry season that kind of changed from I that? don't, yeah. I was wondering that too. That's oh, okay. a really good observation. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Okay, so next Maybe time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> the paper that that's from, um, Swain at all. It's it's a really interesting paper. I can put it in the chat, but um great. Yeah, yeah please put yeah, that in that chat. Maybe in there's some mention to it. Um, but all things I'll hand things over to Jen now. Thanks, Dee. Uh so a uh, couple other questions for Erica. Um, and I think this first question was maybe referring to one of your slides, Erica, where you were talking about the implications of maybe less snow with earlier melt. Um, you know, so when when water I guess water and snow arrive through the period of our usage. How much more water are we actually losing through evaporation? Mm. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, and I wish I had a better answer. <laughs> the the evaporation and transpiration. So those two terms together, we always kind of lump, lump into this evapotranspiration term. Uh -huh. um, that's really just the amount of water that's going back to the atmosphere. Uh -huh. That's um, really a uh, huge control on our hydrologic budget. Um, in some places in the West, it can be you know, up to 30 to 50% of, of total water loss. Um, so, but, it, it, but it's really difficult to constrain because it's at the land surface, right? So we have, we have interaction between uh, what's going on in the atmosphere and what's going on in the subsurface. And that's kind of why I was pointing to these to these advancements in bedrock through atmosphere models, because, um, you know, again, with the pulling of the, the rope analogy, I could use that here too. You, you have, um, for example, a warmer climate where, um, where you have uh, greater temperatures that, that stress the plants um, or just pull, you know, it doesn't have to be a plant, it could just be more water evaporating out into the atmosphere. But then that also causes uh, drier soils. So perhaps you might have plant mortality. Um, you have different changes in where the water is moving because of all these changes in, 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 in terms of the warming. So it's not actually very straight. And then you have things like wildfires coming through that kind of just change the whole landscape entirely. Um, so it's, um, that's a big, that's a big sort of question mark in, in future water balance. Um, type investigations. And, and I think, um, yeah, ecologists uh, specifically think about uh, running models that say there's all these considerations occurring simultaneously. And um, can we better inform our models in terms of how we'd expect land surface processes to occur? Can we, um, I talked about some equations before, can we put more information about um, 
how the system, how, how vegetation uses water or how the atmosphere um, takes water out, you know, just in general. Um, I think I think that's kind of a big open question in the field right now is, is sort of the evaporation piece. Uh, thanks, Erica. Um, you've actually mentioned some of the equations we're using. We did get a question from, uh, from an audience member who's wondering uh, a little bit more, I think they'd like to hear a little bit more about the governing equations that you use for your research. Like what's the foundation, what's the basis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, so, well, if you want to know all the details, I can <laughs> send you some papers, but um, some of the models that we use really, um, really focus on the subsurface part. So we use a uh, three-dimensional way to solve uh, subsurface flow via Richard's equation in the subsurface. So we, so we can model um, this, it's a partial differential equation. So, you know, that's why we also need these really powerful modeling tools to, um, to be able to handle the solving of that equation. Um, at the land surface, we're, we're, we're solving the water energy budget. And so we have considerations of uh, to model conductance, uh, reflectivity, um, the kind of um, the, the ability of soil and bedrock to hold and release water, uh, the friction of, of, of the land surface and how easily water can move across it. Um, and then in the atmosphere, well, it sounds like Dee could tell us a better uh, <laughs> rundown of that, but then, you know, there's a whole set of different equations that go on in the atmosphere. Um, so, so, so yeah, um, I don't know if that's enough detail or not, but I, I think I'm guessing so. <laughs> Thanks, Erica. Uh, sure. Let's actually hand it back over to Dee. Yeah, sure. Um, we have a great question about, you know, using possibly using terracing gullies as a mitigation measure. And that question that I said, I have a question to follow up what you were just saying. You know, it seems like, especially in the area again, where you were working, um, the grazing of the animals were really sort of this point at which we were, we started to transition into the badlands. And I'm wondering, are there techniques that farmers can use, you know, like moving cattle around or have you guys found any sort of, be and then the, the terracing also was that question, but I'm what is the solution to just stop grazing animals there? Or is the solution to, is there another type of less extreme solution? Yeah. Um, I'm really glad you brought that up because I don't want to make grazing the, the bad guy here. Um, there are sustainable ways to graze. Um, and it's a really interesting field and people are doing a lot of great work. And um, actually I've found that ranchers are often, you know, they're out there observing the system. They're often very savvy in terms of, of managing their landscapes and, and knowing how to take good care of the land. And I've seen such great um, sustainable grazing practices. So I don't wanna make that the bad guy. <laughs> um, Understanding what parts of the landscape are most fragile is a first step towards this. There are places, if climate changes um, and, and that system gets really close to this edge of, of stability for soils, there may be places that probably shouldn't be grazed. These would probably be places farther south where climate change has put them up against that threshold sooner. Um, and then also different kinds of rocks. So I've been talking about um, the weakest types of bedrock because these are really the canary in the coal mine in terms of these deep um, landscape changing gullies that, that cut way below the soil into the, the deep bedrock architecture of the landscape and really change things dramatically. Um, other places with um, stronger bedrock, you might lose the soil, but you wouldn't necessarily lose the, the potential to have a hill slope that doesn't drain quite that dramatically. And we're seeing that on Santa Cruz Island. I have another project looking at differences in the same grazing perturbation in different types of rock. And we see that that places um, with a little bit stronger bedrock, once that grazing pressure has been removed, the soils are starting to regenerate there because they haven't 
they don't have these intense drains cut through them. Um, the, the, the architecture of the bedrock is, is holding up. So, so not all hillsides are, are this fragile. So that's one piece um, really thinking about where to graze um, and in what climates to graze. And then in terms of direct restoration, I, I think prevention is really the most effective way to do this. So if we start thinking about land management before these gullies form, it's a lot easier to, to keep these landscapes intact. Um, once the gullies are in place, they do have this feedback where they drain hillslope soils of their water and make it a lot harder to keep plants healthy right next to the gully because you're just losing that water. Um, like a lot of places where they have wet, long wet seasons, they put drains underneath the fields to extend the growing season. And that's essentially what these are. These are drains that take water off that hill slope. So once they're there, there's still a lot that can be done. Terracing is, is one of those, those mitigation solutions. But I think really focusing on prevention is the first thing. In terms of restoration of gullies, um, you have to think about the, the process that's forming it. And it's again, this tug of war. So thinking about that water flowing into the gully, if you can disperse that water, if, if the gully is there because road was concentrating flow, um, redesigning that road so that it sheds water more uniformly and doesn't give you all that water in one spot or if the gully is already established, making sure no water gets into that gully, that really takes out to channel erosion and allows the plants to, to start getting their, their hold back. Um, so stuff like that, I think thinking about that balance, there's ways to help plants get established. I think if the gully is already there, there's such efficient features at, at concentrating flow that really working on uh, removing the drainage area or the parts of the hill slope that funnel their water to that spot is really a, a good first step. Excellent. Sounds like both of these, uh, this research, very complicated areas that need a lot more research. Um, and you guys were so grateful for all the work that you're doing. And I'm, I'm, I, I didn't, I'm glad you mentioned about that farmers really probably do have this really wealth of information that they can share with the scientists as well, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm glad that you pointed that out also. Um, we wanna thank you again, both Berkeley Lab and UC Berkeley Science at Cal for being here. Thank you to our wonderful audience as usual for being incredibly active participants and, and the Q&A questions are, are always the highlight of these, of these presentations. So I wanna thank you. I'm sure Jen has parting words as well. Definitely. Uh, thanks again to both Carrie and Erica for their fantastic presentations and for our audience. We really appreciate you joining us. Uh, you know, we've got one more Midday Science Cafe, as Dee mentioned at the start uh, <laughs> lecture. We're going to be talking about the microbiome and yes. microbiome research next month. Um, so we hope you tune in for that. And as always, if there are topics you're interested in hearing about, let us know. We'd love to, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, with that, if you're, uh, you know, interested in staying up to date on research from both of our institutions at science at cal.berkeley.edu and lbl.gov. Uh, beyond that, I think we'll just say stay warm, stay dry. We're grateful for the rain and we'll see you next month. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.